Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of Get to Know the HPO. My name is Abigail Richardson Schulte, and I'm composer in residence for the HPO. Now, today is our 2020 21 season launch, and I'm joined by our music director, Gemma New, live with us here from New Zealand, and our executive director, Kim Varian. Welcome, Gemma and Kim. Hi, Abigail. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Now, uh, that uh, last day we were on stage is just cemented in my memory. It was March 13th and Friday the 13th at that. We had the full orchestra on stage, just about to start rehearsal and then canceled it all. So uh, Gemma, what have things been like for you at that time? Were all of your engagements canceled? Um, sadly, yes, uh, for the, you know, uh, the last five months, uh, it's been pretty uh, quiet when we all need to stay inside and be safe. Um, I've been in San Diego in California, um, soaking up a bit of sunshine. And, uh, you know, it, we, there's been a few recordings here or there, but um, now I'm in New Zealand and we have concerts coming up. Uh, there has been a little bit of a resurgence of the virus here. So um, there the areas are going up in levels. And so we need to be um, and th that's not a good thing. Uh, so <laughs> we're trying to bring it down, and um, I, you know, I, we just have to take every step um, one by one, and and see how we can perform live music uh, where possible. And that's what we've organised in Hamilton for our next season. So we're very excited to announce the season mm -hmm. today for all of you. I hope you can <laughs> all make it and enjoy this music. Absolutely. We'll get to that that in just a few minutes. Um, now, Kim, uh, when all of this started, you were in an interim position with the HPO, and we're so glad now that you are our, our executive director. And I have to say, you handled this with uh, sc such skill and care, and, and we're delighted to have you. Now, can you give us an idea about how things have been for the organization during this time? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, that was quite a day to remember. Friday the 13th of March. And so from that day, really, um, as you've mentioned, all of our main stage concerts for that re remainder of the 1920 season were canceled. So main stage from March through May, including our intimate and immersive series and our community programming, um, all canceled. So we activated very quickly in trying to manage those cancellations, offering refunds to ticket holders or um, donation receipts to ticket holders. Um, I have to just take a moment to just thank those ticket holders so very much. Um, nearly 60% of those ticket holders donated their value of their tickets back to the HPO. Wow. And it's been a tremendous outpouring of support from our donors, new donors as well, uh, coming in in the community to really say to the HPO, let's keep going. So that has really spurred us on and that was uh, tremendous. So we were managing cancellations in that time and our musicians had gone home. We had um, all of our um, staff had moved home to work from home and continue to work from home now. I don't think we realized on March 13th just what this was going to look like uh, many months later, but um, there was no playbook. So we just got back to our fundamentals, worked together really, really closely with our musicians and with Gemma and with our wonderful board who have showed such leadership and support through all of this um, to reimagine our 2021 season. So in the interim, in thinking about what the 2021 season we had planned looked like and what how it might adapt in future, um, we went through many scenarios and we did that with our musicians, with our staff, with Gemma. Gemma and I had so many uh, evening calls and uh, thinking about all the different things that were possible. Um, and, um, and so we found a way forward in launching a 2021 season. I'd love to also mention that um, one of the very important things for us in this quiet time, while we re, you know, um, planned what was possible for 2021, was really staying engaged with the community. So working with our musicians and staff coming up with Get to Know the HPO, this fabulous series, yeah. has been fantastic. And uh, we've received such great feedback. And I think people are really enjoying it. And I'm glad it's something that we'll be able to carry on into the future with. Um, so thank you, Abby, for um, hosting and being such a... Um, a pillar for this uh, program. It's been tremendous. 
Oh, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, great for me to get to know the musicians a little bit more as well. Uh, speaking of musicians, Lisa Pelton, who was a, a violinist with us, says, I remember the 13th too. What a day, but looking forward to this coming season. Hi, friends, and a heart. Uh, and uh, our board member, Anne Tenier, writes, we're so happy Kim is our permanent executive director as well. So uh, it, it's great yeah. to have this wonderful support uh, all around. Mm for our organization uh, from, from within. Now, Gemma, how on earth do you start artistic programming for a season like this, which is so uncertain? Yes, uh, there have been uh, some new rules put in place to keep everyone safe. And so we said, well, what are these guidelines and how can we perform live music with them in place? So uh, we have found ways that, um, and that's the um, beauty of being a creative artist, we have to be creative, practically speaking here. Um, so uh, we have found ways. So the first five months uh, will be uh, chamber music, a smaller ensemble. That means it's um, easier for us to find a space that can have these up to five players together at one time. And um, the other uh, thing that we've really explored for the first time that we've been wanting to do for a while, but now it's, there's a really good reason to do it, is to broadcast our concerts so that people can see them in the safety and the comfort of their own homes uh, together with their families. And so uh, we've been investigating the technology that we need to do that. And I think we've got it covered. Um, we'll start with these smaller ensembles, which um, have opened an avenue into the chamber music realm. There's so much a repertoire that we have now discovered that is beautiful and they're by composers that um, sometimes you'll say I know that composer because I've heard an orchestral piece by this person um, and then others you say I've never heard of that person at all but I am stunned by that work and I, in researching uh, this repertoire and in having conversations with the musicians who have made some wonderful suggestions about what we should play I've been absolutely amazed by the beauty of this music, by some of the most um, imaginative colors uh, and, um, and also really interesting narratives um, behind the story, uh, behind the music. So I, I think that it will be um, a real treat for our audience to hear this chamber music that we often don't get an opportunity to play. Um, and that's in the first five months. And then we go to the full orchestra in the First Ontario Concert Hall. Um, we'll have got all the technology uh, really well set in place to have the whole orchestra now recorded with video and audio and to make an amazing show out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. I love the combination of moving from uh, from chamber to full orchestra. Now, Kim, can you tell us how it will work? How do our audience? Uh, how how do we buy tickets for this? Sure, absolutely. So, as Gemma said, we have a couple of series that we're we're um, putting together. So, September to January, um, it's um, chamber music, chamber ensembles, and then larger orchestra coming back into the concert hall. So we're offering two subscription packages. They're broadcast packages, which allows people to view the HPO and enjoy the music of the HPO right in their living room. So you can enjoy it on your smart TV, your tablet, your computer, or your smartphone. Um, and this is something, of course, we've never done before. And I think that um, something that we're really embracing, and as Gemma said, we are going to be creating a show. So how it will work is, um, these packages allow you to view us very simply by clicking a link and seeing the concert. And that concert will include behind the scenes um, from the rehearsals, interviews with musicians, more information on the music being presented on the main stage, and all of the wonderful details that people have come to really enjoy in our pre-concert talks when we're live. So all of that will be there for them in the broadcast. So. As Gemma mentioned, these are broadcasted, so we're going to be recording them. All of these concerts will be recorded, and then um, links will be sent to subscribers or, or broadcast purchasers the day before the um, intended launch date of that concert. So, for example, our opening night is September 26th. Saturday, September 26th at 7.30. We've kept the date, we've kept the time of our normal opening a night. And so we encourage people to broadcast that concert at that time. They will then be able to watch that concert um, as often as they'd like for the next 30 days. Um, and then they'll get their next link to the next concert the day before it goes live and then they can watch it. So if at any time through um, health and safety guidelines, 
an audience is possible for us, as Gemma said, we will be going live and we will be selling tickets to uh, the concerts. So we are following um, the health and safety guidelines very stringently, of course. And right now we can be 50 people inside. So that's quite a small audience. So we're being very cautious. So um, we are not selling live ticket subscriptions at this time. We're selling broadcast online ticket subscriptions at this time. And then if live concerts become available, two weeks before that date of the live concert, we will be selling tickets. So I know that's a lot of detail. We're gonna have all of that on our HPO website so people can really um, reference it and know you'll be getting emails from us if live tickets become available. And we imagine that that will be certainly um, with social distancing in place. We're working very closely with the concert hall to make sure that all of those protocols are in place for patrons. So that's how it will work if that, um, to give you some indication. Yeah, it's it's very well thought out, uh, and uh, it's it's nice to see too that we have some audience members watching who say they they received their subscription packages mm -hmm. and they've already purchased. Oh, wonderful! Um, we we have a, a question here from Kate Morrison who already said that she's purchased, but uh, she asks, are there any plans to continue recording the concerts past this season? Yes, do you want me to take that, Gemma? Yeah, so I would say I'd love to say that. Yes, we, we would. I mean, I think we see, we're really embracing recording and broadcasting. It's something we've wanted to do for some time. And certainly there's no better time than now uh, to do this. So we can really see this being uh, recordings being something that can live alongside our live performances into the future. I mean, there are so many people that aren't able to come to the concert hall or so many new people we could reach, um, you know, beyond our borders that might be interested in, in seeing us perform. So yes, we do, we do plan on continuing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been asked so many times to uh, put my talk and tea online, and and the talk and tea is actually living this year, so we'll be we'll we'll be videoed, uh, which is great. Yeah. Um, just uh, one more comment here before we have Gemma to uh, release the season to us here. <laughs> Daryl Dockstater, uh says, as a casual listener, I can say that the HPO has made quite an impression on myself and all my special needs clientele. We are missing your magic. Looking forward to whatever you can do this season. We will to continue to support the HPO however we can. Thank you, Daryl. Yeah. We, uh, we appreciate your support very much. Yeah. All right, Gemma, it is time. Can you take us through the season? Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> it would be my pleasure. So uh, as um, Kim has mentioned, we have three season uh, three seasons yes split up into um different um chamber music we have orchestra and then we have the intimate and immersive concerts in june we'll have two of those um so there's a lot of variety for um everyone to enjoy and um as i said there'll be something familiar there'll be something brand new let's go to the next slide um and what I thought was, you know, we've been going through admittedly a, a difficult time, I think it'd be fair to say. And so what can music bring? And I thought well, music can bring joy and it can warm our hearts and it may, can make us smile and it can uplift us. And it can be so beautiful that we are absolutely entranced with um, the colors and, and the melodies of of music and so I thought well we need as much of that in this season as possible we really want to um, support one another and lift us up so we start the season in September with joyful Mozart uh, this uh, program has two quartets by Mozart that he wrote on his travels um, back in the day uh, just like today the string quartet was really popular and um what's more back in mozart's time uh the quartet uh often has two violins um but they took one of the violins away and put in a woodwind instrument um and so there was some really distinguished um, amateur musicians who played the flute um frederick the great of prussia played the flute and king george the third of England played the flute. So it was a really high status instrument. And Mozart was asked to write three quartets for a flute, um, for the flute and, and string players. And so we have this um, most famous one in D major 
it looks back at um, the ornamentation, that flourishing, and that also that simplicity and grace of the Baroque style. And so I thought it would be really important to add a Baroque composer, and not just any Baroque composer. We have the highest, most um, famous name in his day. Uh, you think of Bach and Handel, you know, Bach's pretty, pretty famous right now, but he was looking at Telemann for inspiration and Telemann was the leader of the Baroque period. So um, this piece uh, is stunningly beautiful. I hope you get to um, have a listen to it um, multiple times, as well as having Cecilia and Liz play it in this concert, because I love putting it on. I, I put it on um, so often when I want to relax and just think, oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. It's one of my favorite pieces now. Um, so I hope it will be one of yours as well. And uh, we will also have on this program um, a Gina Stera a duo for flute and oboe. Alberto Gina Stera was an Argentinian composer. And uh, you may think, oh, uh, Gina Stera, Gina Stera, uh, which, uh, is it the, um, pron which pronunciation should I do? His uh, mother was Catalan and his father was Italian. And so he preferred to have the Catalan and Italian pronunciations of his name. I always wondered about that. And, and I hope that gives a bit of clarity for you too. And um, this piece is really, it has a bit of a mystic spiritual quality. And it also brings this beautifully subtle presence of Argen Argentinian folk music. It is an absolute delight with the soft, uh, slow, languid melodies, but then also uh, some really lively uh, movements as well. And uh, and then we have the oboe quartet to finish, uh, this being the superstar soloist of the Munich Orchestra that Mozart wrote especially for. Uh, so we have that beginning, our season, uh, with all our wonderful players. And then for October, Leslie and Ale join us once more with the other HPO principal woodwinds. We have Dominic, Eric, and Jesse making up a woodwind quintet. And you see here we have two works for woodwind quintet. Alison Yunfei Zhang recently won a SOCAN award with this fascinating quintet. Um, she is a wonderful uh, Canadian composer that I've discovered on this journey. And this piece completely transforms the typical sounds of the woodwinds. She's very creative and imaginative and was inspired by Elizabeth Jennings' poem, The Bird Sunrise in Winter. So you can imagine a flock of birds taking flight with all their squawking and, and also their graceful wings outstretched as they rise to the sky. And uh, then to f complete the program, we have Barbara's Summer Music. This is, a, a, again, a beautiful work. Uh, it has a relaxed atmosphere. It, um, was, it has a bit of a reference to Gershwin's Summertime, uh, and um, I hope it will bring warmth to our hearts. Uh, it is a very uh, popular and, and uh, standard work of the woodwind uh, quintet repertoire. We also have in between these two works an array of solo woodwind works and one duo to, in the middle of, of this uh, lineup of miniatures. I think of it as a box of chocolates and you get to see all the little details and they're all little pieces, but they show for us the unique colors of the woodwinds. Uh, the woodwind section is at the heart of the orchestra and all four in instruments and, and sections of the woodwind uh, section are incredibly different. Uh, you, you think of the string section and all the strings kind of sound the same. They had the same sound color. The brass also the same sound color, but for woodwinds, the colors are very different. And so I wanted to highlight that for our audience, for all of you. And um, I wanted for our musicians to be able to tell a personal story with uh, the music. And so they've chosen these pieces um, uh, to perform for you. We have an amazing array, array of different styles and I wanted to just touch upon them. We have two German Romantic composers, um, Clark Ellett and Kroll for pieces um, by, uh, for solo flute and solo horn. 
back in October, we're still in October. Um, and then we go to um, a Hungarian composer, P Bella Kovács, um, who wrote a homage to Manuel de Fire, a Spanish composer. Um, so you have those, um, that Hungarian flair, as well as the, um, the Spanish uh, influence inspiration for him. Um, Iman Habibi is a Canadian Iranian composer who's recently moved to Toronto and we, we've been wanting to do his music for quite some time and this um, uh, is a great opportunity to play his piece Surge. Uh, Leslie Newman has chosen this and it's um, in in part inspired by Iman's ongoing studies in folk rhythms and melodies from southern Iran. Um, we also have uh, Tomasi's Evocations for solo oboe, which is made up of four movements, um, each one inspired by a different part of the world. Uh, we have Peru, Nigeria, Cambodia, and Scotland. So he looked all around the world and found inspiration for these movements. I can't wait to, to hear Ale play them. And we also have a piece for solo bassoon. It's one of my favorite pieces on the season. Dai Fuji Kuras, a Japanese composer, His Secret Leaves. And all of his pieces have really interesting titles and the way that they um, create a, a sound world, a picture that of nature often, um, is really fascinating. The bassoon sounds transformed in this piece with the extended, uh, the uh, multi-phonics and the, um, the different uh, ways that uh, he, he makes the bassoon sound like a, perhaps a forest with, with leaves and this mysterious atmosphere. Uh, we also have very quirky pieces by Pulank and Stravinsky on this program um, for clarinet and clarinet and bassoon. So there is a lot to enjoy of these little morsels, all a real great dessert. Let's go to Mo uh, sorry, we go to November to our next program. And um, as we always have in November, uh, we have a concert near Remembrance Day, and I really wanted to make sure that we uh, keep this tradition. So we will have a wonderful uh, collaboration with the Rileys and we want this program to respectfully reflect on the wars of the past and to explore the themes of uh, grief and also healing. So we begin the program with a string quartet um, by Puccini, the great Italian composer that brought us La Boheme and Tosca and Madame Butterfly. And this uh, quartet, Chrysanthemums, is um, the, uh, the composer's response to a sudden death of a, of a friend um, who had quite an interesting story in his, his own life, having been through war. Uh, so it's a beautiful, heartfelt piece um, of, of grief, really, and also intense love for his friend. Um, we have at the end of the program also another string quartet. This is by Shostakovich, and he was greatly moved when he went to Dresden and saw the, um, the aftermath uh, of, of the destruction there. And he was also thinking about his own life and career in, in Russia, which was going through turbulent times. And so this is a really deeply personal work um, that Shostakovich wrote really about his own struggles through that. Uh, another amazing Russian composer that we have on this program is Sergei Prokofiev. Uh, who wrote a sonata for two violins, and uh, this is one of his masterpieces. Uh, we have Bethany and Suhashini performing this duo, and they have also selected um, excerpts from Bach sonatas for solo violin, as well as contemporary pieces of today to share with you. And so we have this um, spiritual component of Bach. I uh, always find it um, enriching uh, and soothing to listen to Bach, and I hope you will also have that experience when you listen to solo Bach, and I know that Bethany and Suhashini will perform it so beautifully. And then we have also the pieces that they've personally chosen from the music of today. We have Bethany performing Vincent Ho's morning song, song sorry, morning song. Um, he wrote it when he was in California, and he was seeing out the window of the sun rise uh, and he was struck by the beautiful moment of that and once he'd finished the piece 
the sun was risen. And uh, it's, it's a really nice uh, short work uh, that I hope will make us all smile in this, in this difficult theme that we have for the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we have for the program. We also have in this uh, program, Rina Esmail's Darshan. Um, in the Hindu religion, Darshan um, is what you give to see and worship God. So it's a sense uh, looking for the divine. And um, she says when uh, she worked with um, Vijay Gupta, the, the violinist who was uh, premiering this work, and they both saw the divine in each other, which I thought was really nice. And um, the piece is part of a larger work that takes us uh, through a journey of uh, through grief and the process of that. So I thought it was really fitting. And we thank Sahashini for uh, suggesting that work. We'll go to the December. And for December, yes, we have the tradition of our holiday program still at large and we have the wonderful hpo brass quintet performing for us this season holiday season we'll have the favorites from the nutcracker and the messiah we'll have the grinch making an appearance uh we'll have hanukkah songs lots of jingle bells and horse whinnying and carols and sing-along songs and lots of fun so i hope you can join us and enjoy the holiday season with us. And then we go to uh, January, where our group expands. We have now two quintets, and they'll take each a half of the program. Um, and it's lovely that through time, I hope we'll be really ready for having these 10 musicians here to provide the most wonderful music. We have a string quintet and we have a woodwind quintet. So a lot of variety for you in this program. Um, the last work on the program will be the Dvorak string quintet number two. Uh, Dvorak being, um, a, 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 having been mentored in a way by Brahms, um, he's one of the great romantic composers and he also has that wonderful Czech uh, Republic uh, folk music, that Hungarian folk music, and um, this string quintet is really full of romance. It's our uh, romantic music for uh, for uh, uh, this part of the season, and we will also have Tchaikovsky's three dances. I know that so many of you love Tchaikovsky, and so we've got some of the Nutcracker in December, and we have some dances here in January, and. Um, this will also be uh, complemented by two French composers and their works. Uh, we have Jacques Hibert, um, a very expressive and colorful three short pieces. Um, and then also Jean-Philippe Rameau, uh, the great French opera composer um, of the late Baroque period, who um, wrote a set of courtly dances, very graceful and elegant and have a sim simple beauty to them. Uh, these will be performed as well. And we also have sorry, just one more piece on this program. Uh, you say, I want to hear something new on this program. I want to hear something that's part of our home land. Yes, we have that for you as well. That we have a piece that is Quintet Four Winds um, by Bill Rosen, or William Rosen, I should say. But we know him because he worked with the HBO. He has been a conductor in the past, and uh, we love having him back. And we are really looking forward to performing his music in this program. And then we go to February, where we go to a new format, where we're back in the concert hall, the first Ontario concert hall as an orchestra. And uh, we have this uh, favorite of the repertoire, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. You're going to hear the, the dripping sweat of summer, and you'll hear the icy uh, ice over the lakes in the winter, and a bit of merriment and autumn and, and also the flowers blossoming in spring. Um, this idea of the natural world um, is also evident in Juliet Palmer's uh, uh, Firebreak, which is a brand new piece that we were about to play in March. And 
that was the day when um, this pandemic started. So we're so glad we can come back as an orchestra and play this fire break for you in concert. Um, and she was fascinated with um, the Australian forests. Um, being a New Zealand and Canadian composer, Australia is not far away from where I am right now. And um, they have gone through some uh, devastating fires recently, and she was aware of that and wanted to appreciate the ancient stories of the forest and the sounds that the wood uh, makes uh, when when burned the hollow trunks and um, to really explore a new sound world with this piece. So it is quite a journey. And um, we have also Stravinsky in this program, one of my favorite composers. Uh, this Dos Concertant looks back at the music of Vivaldi's time. Uh, he, the Concertant style came from the Baroque period. And the dance part of this work uh, is from his rich history and experience with ballet. And um, you can just, it was written for orchestra for us to imagine dances. And it takes you right from New York's Fifth Avenue all the way to Hollywood Sunset Boulevard in this piece with so much quirkiness and jazz and circus and barbershop quartets in between. So it's it's also uh, one of my favorite pieces where I'm so glad we can have it in the season and it makes it such a nice um, a present when you wrap all these three up. Uh, but not only that, we have two of our principal string players performing the Vivaldi Four Seasons. We have Lance and Bethany, as you can see there, smiling. And uh, it is such a pleasure to be able to highlight the immense talent in our orchestra with having them up on stage as soloists. And this is going to be a spectacular event. We'll go to uh, March now, where you will see a program of uh, four composers that begin, uh, that, whose last names begin with a B. Uh, that was a coincidence, I have to say. I, although I love alliteration, it's always nice. Um, this program is based upon um, the spiritual uplifting uh, nature of music. And so we start with a composer who dropped to his knees when he heard a choir in the opposite room, just because he had that fervent uh, nature to pray when he heard um, uh, religious music being performed in the other room. He had a great um, conviction uh, in his life for the divine. And um, I think it's nice to be able to perform some of his music. This is one of the earlier works that he had that is full of kind of really long, uh, stretching, beautiful melodies and harmonies. And it's a wonderful introduction to welcome you to the music of Bruckner. Hopefully we can do some of his symphonies in the future. Uh, and then we go to Andrew Balfour's Kewitan Asakwas. And in this piece, um, Andrew appreciates the spiritual nature of our northern landscape and the environment uh, with the great northern lights and the sky, the sunsets, uh, and sunrises and the stars and the moon across this expansive land. And then we go to Britain, who was looking at the soul and uh, inside our human psyche, um, he chose poems uh, and uh, set music to them. And the, all of the poems have uh, themes of life and metaphors of life going to death, the uh, sun, setting, for example. And uh, it is a stunning work for tenor horn uh, and tenor. Uh, so we have here our principal horn, uh, Je Jesse Brooks, performing as soloist. And we have our um, wonderful Lawrence Williford performing as tenor. Um, and Lawrence, you may recognize him from Mozart's Requiem that we performed a couple of years ago. And you'll definitely recognize the gentleman next to Jesse. Uh, we have Steve Satarsky, our concert master, who will be conductor for this program, taking the podium. And uh, we are so glad to have his musicianship and his leadership with this program. 
And he has especially chosen Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 8 to complete this program. Uh, we love Beethoven and we're so glad when we can perform his wonderful symphonies. And uh, this one was, I think, his favorite. He saw it as his greatest work. Um, it is more classical sounding than his uh, some of the other ones, say uh, Eroica that was always pushing and being defiant and heroic. Um, but this one has a lot of grace to it and uh, a lot of joy as well. He went through some incredibly tough times. He went through two wars in Vienna and um, he went through a, a, his loss of hearing. And yet when he had his darkest, deepest times, he wrote the most happy, uh, joyful music and this is one of these examples so i think it's a, a, an inspiration to us all to to cheer up and, and keep going uh, and now we go to april where we have um pro, uh, music of a really fun uh, style um often so this first piece for example by mio is called the ox or the bull on the roof and he was imagining that he was writing for Charlie Chaplin. And that sounds like a lot of fun to me. Um, he was also uh, recently experiencing two years in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And so he was inspired and he researched heavily the tangos, the Brazilian polkas, the sambas, and he even had a bit of Portuguese fado that brought its way into this uh, piece. And this composer, Darius Mio, was also really um, a very interesting composer that I'm sure will investigate his life and, and appreciate that as well around the time. Uh, we also have on this piece, uh, sorry, on this program, Piazzolla's Four Seasons of Buenos Aires. And um, so he, he loved Vivaldi's Four Seasons as well, just like you. And he thought, we need one for the Southern Hemisphere, which I completely agree about. And so this um, piece was originally written as four tangos for his band. He had a quintet of violin, which uh, the violin also played viola, but piano, electric guitar, double bass, and bandonian. And uh, so these tangos were then arranged by um, a Russian composer for string orchestra, as well as soloist. And Steve will be returning on stage now as soloist in this program to perform this wonderful work. Uh, we then, I, I might just skip over the fellow if one, if you allow, because the Piazzolla and Gina Stera composers had a relationship. Um, Gina Stera was a mentor of Piazzolla and they both were Argentinian. So there's a wonderful connection there. And this um, Variaciones uh, Concertantes um, allows for all of the sections of the orchestra to be highlighted and it really allows for our musicians to shine. Circling back to HBO's uh, Composer Fellow, we love having Composer Fellows. This is a new initiative that Abigail spearheaded, and it, we have had two fellows this season, who you, whose pieces you will see in the INIs, and then we have two new fellows for this season. We're really glad to continue this during the um, pandemic situation. And so this will be a brand new work, and we look forward to getting to know that composer very soon into May now. We have uh, a real favorite of the repertoire, Mozart's Clarinet Concerto, performed by our principal clarinetist, Dominic Desotels. And uh, I'm sure everyone loves the music of Mozart. Hey, we had that in September and now we finish the, the main stage season with more of this joyful Mozart. And to complement this piece, we have also Strauss's Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, uh, which is a really humorous work. Um, there are many dances that are in the style of the French Baroque master Lully. Um, and there's also a journey. Each one of them is a little painting or, or a comical story of this young man that wants to be quite um, 
well to do and so he decides that he needs to learn how to fence and so he has a fencing master in the lessons and it doesn't go so well it's quite dramatic uh, there's also the dance of the tailors who come in and make him a very nice tailored coat and uh, I think Strauss makes a little bit of fun of their needles and sewing um, and then we have uh, the dinner as the grand finale which has um, quotes from other favorite works so uh, the Wagner's ring cycle makes an um, uh, an entrance when the salmon is brought in, for example, the Rheingold being the river. Um, we have Strauss's Don Quixote coming in, um, perhaps for the sheep being, uh, uh, there's, there's sheep noises in there. And then um, also Verdi's La Donne Mobile. And um, there's all, of course, a great fiasco, just like a great opera. This piece has it all. So uh, it is also a wonderful opportunity to hear some amazing solos. There's some great clarinet solos, uh, flute, oboe, uh, uh, concert master, and also trombone uh, and piano. Uh, so there's a, a lot to enjoy in this piece, lots of great colors and, and that romantic uh, style as well. And then we go to June, where we have two I and I concerts. That's intimate and immersive, just those things, uh, and and also interactive and um, this cool vibe, contemporary vibe. And we thought, well, contemporary music lends itself so well to this. We love to have the um, intimate atmosphere of musicians and audience members mingling. I hope we can return to that by this time of year. And um, also to have the composers tell their story. And I'm sure we'll have um, an opportunity for that in these programs. Now, when you look at this um, this particular uh, program, Earth Shine, and you see um, Helieco rising and the Earth split open and starburst and Roricelli, you can tell, and down the rabbit hole, it's all um, very active music, and uh, it's also about the sky and the land. Um, so we look at the universe and beyond in this program, uh, and all of these pieces have a different perspective on light and um, darkness and also um, uh, these themes that I've been just saying. So um, I think it will be a really great uh, exploration into that. We, uh, oh, I should say um, that we have Andrew Clark here um, with Hell Echo Rising. This is a brand new work and Andrew was one of our um, HBO Composer Fellows of this past season. And we are so glad that we're able to perform his work um, when it was uh, planned for May. And we can do it now in June in 2021. And we'll go to our second HPO INI program, Dragon Unfolding. Uh, this is after the title that, of the piece by Kelly Marie Murphy, um, who wrote about a NASA scientist that quit his job to do his passion, which was origami. And um, there's a lot of um, really amazing stories that are connected with this work and with our origami that she explores. So uh, that's really great. And we begin the program with Louis Ramirez's new work. And this is a new work that is not the title yet. We have, will have one um, when he has it ready for us. And he is a, an HPO composer fellow. So we're really glad to be performing this new work on this program. We have, of course, also our resident composer, Abigail Richardson Schulter, with Downstream, which is a little bit of a piano concerto in a way. And so you'll hear this wonderful connection between the piano and the orchestral sounds. And you will hear also, I think, a lot of waterways because it describes the waterfalls of Hamilton. So that is our season in a nutshell, although it was a very big nutshell. I, I went on for a very long time. I hope you will join us for this season, which is so full of our uh, programs that we can relate to and we've possibly heard before and we feel that we're at home with that music and then also music that we opens a window for us uh, of discovery.
Thank you so much, Gemma. It's, uh, it's really lovely to have you explain the season in your own words. Um, really, what, what a treat. Um, we have a, a few comments here. Heather Beal, one of our wonderful board members, gives us some applause and, and looking forward to the new season. Um, and uh, Roy Dickinson writes, thank you, Gemma, for bringing the Philharmonic back to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Abigail for introducing us to so many members of the orchestra this summer. You've kept the mm -hmm. HPO vibrant throughout this difficult period. Thank you, Roy, that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, now, uh, Gemma, it's, uh, it, it's really interesting that we start with the chamber music portion. Can you tell us how much were you working with the musicians to come up with the, the chamber music portion? of the season. Yes, absolutely. Um, I really wanted the musicians to feel strongly about the music that they were presenting. So it was very important that we had this teamwork here. And we began the process by sending out a survey and saying, players, what do you feel most comfortable with? Um, what are you interested in playing? And that gave me a sense of where to begin. And then I made a proposal uh, and then had started to have a um, an individual conversation with each and every player so that we made sure that they were available for the dates that we wanted them to join and also uh, that we were putting them in a group of uh, uh, so that they could perform the music that they were most passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure that's very special for musicians. A lot of orchestra players think they don't get much say in what they perform. So this is a, a special season because of that. Yeah. Um, another comment here, Anne Tenier writes, well done Gemma and the full HBO team. So excited for this upcoming season. Great, thanks, Anne. Now, uh, Kim, over to you. Mm. We usually have such a strong selection of, of uh, programming for the community. How will that work this year? Yes, we do. As you know, Abby, you're so involved with our community programs. Um, we usually host about 80 programs. Uh, we were getting up to 80 programs a season. Um, but now with recording and broadcasting, we'll be able to actually continue those partnerships very well. I mean, everyone is in the same position we're in, you know, um, limited number of gatherings allowed and uh, their programs would like, they'd like to see their programs move forward. So we've already continued, we've, we've continued to uh, support our partners through this season, through this summertime. Um, and we're already uh, planning recordings for education and the library next week. So our partnerships with the library and their noon hour concert series will continue with us um, performing um, and broadcasting with them. And we've uh, struck a new partnership with Hamilton West Wentworth District School Board for um, elementary and secondary schools for music education programs throughout their school year, which is very exciting. And we look forward to doing. Our adopt a school program will continue as will our programming at seniors residences and community centers across uh, the region. So it's a great opportunity actually for our community programs. We will of course try to be live where we can. Um, we have a wonderful gallery series as well and a happy hour series that we was so much fun to put on um, our composer um, festival, our annual composer festival will continue and it will be virtual if needed and some um, events can be live if possible. So we're open to everything and we're flexible to do what's best. Um, and right now planning for um, recording and broadcasting. So that will continue. Right, and, and you have something special lined up for frontline workers, right? We do, we do. Well, we're just so grateful. I know the city is so grateful. Everyone is so grateful for all the work by emergency services and frontline workers. So the HPO would absolutely like to show our gratitude by uh, sharing these broadcasts with them free of charge. Uh, so we're starting with our, throughout the season. So we're starting with our opening night and all frontline workers will receive a free link if they're interested and um, we'll be getting the information out to them and they can just simply sign up and we'll send them the link when the broadcast is live for our opening night concert and then other special engagements throughout the season. So we're very, very grateful for them keeping our city going and really our region going in this time and they continue to do it. So it's just the, all we can do to say thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, uh, this is a really new world for us at the HPO, mm -hmm. getting into recording and, and broadcasting. Uh, does there need to be a, a new agreement made with musicians for things like this? 
Yes, there does, actually. I mean, we work with our current collective agreement with our musicians um, that works in most cases, but of course, um, it doesn't outline all of the um, terms and conditions of recording to this level and to this degree. So we've been working with the American Federation of Musicians, our local union, and our musicians themselves to put those particulars down and uh, make sure that all of those terms and conditions are reflected in how we'll go forward with recording and broadcasting. So that's gone very well. Great. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, just a, a couple of comments here. Uh, Gemma, I think this one is for you from Elaine Galbraith Atkins. It was a very detailed overview. overview. It's obvious that much planning and work have gone into the season. The program is incredibly full. That's great. Great to hear. And uh, a comment from Kate Morrison. This refers to community events. And Kate writes, we're so excited to have you coming to the Hamilton Public Library as well. And we love coming to the HBL. And don't miss the first one on Friday, August 28th. And this, I believe, is our violin duo. <laughs> it is so, our violin duo. And thank you, Kate. She's our partner at the library. That's wonderful. Right. Uh, and just a question here from uh, Jin Spencer. What about a live concert or two outside in the garden at White Hearn before it gets cold? Mm -hmm. Things could be scattered uh, so people don't get closer than two meters. Have, have you considered uh, concerts outside? Yes, we have. Um, and I think uh, we uh, I, I had this whole uh, vision for it, and I think, you know, I, I really hope that there is a way to do it at some point, and I know Kim wants mm -hmm. to do it in the orchestra as well. I think it's finding a way to do it safely is, um, is a challenge, and uh, Kim, take it away. Is there a, a, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, we're looking for, um, we're not able to do it at this time. I mean, just health and safety regulations don't allow us to perform live. It will gather a crowd. Um, and so, and, and we know it will, um, and we hope it will. So it's just not the right time for it. But certainly next summer, it's something that we're really excited to do. Or certainly if the weather uh, stays nice and remains nice, it's something we'd love to add if possible. So we're really just following guidelines closely and doing what we know is possible at this time. We feel that's probably the best best way forward um, to avoid disappointment and to make sure that we're out there as, as planned. But now, it's good that we looked into it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, uh, we're, we're nearly finished uh, the, the season launch today. So if any of you have any last questions for Gemma or Kim, this is your last chance. Um, and uh, Gemma, in the meantime, what are you doing in New Zealand? Oh yes, well, the sun has risen and uh, I am getting out of here because I've been in quarantine for 14 days in this hotel room. Uh, oh, and so that's great. <laughs> um, and then um, we have concerts. We have Beethoven 9 uh, programmed for next week and then uh, two programs with the NZSO the week after. So Dunedin Symphonies next week. Um, and uh, with the new, uh, uh, community transmissions, we have to see what's possible, but I, I really hope that we'll be able to continue to perform this music. Mm -hmm. And are you getting a chance to visit with your family while you're there? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. Um, so I Open will up be. To them right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, checking out of the hotel and then um, taking a flight down to Wellington to see my parents today. Oh, so that's great. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Well, it doesn't look like there are any further questions. So I thank both of you for sharing this. And I know it has been a, a huge endeavor and uh, you're both very, very flexible and, and pivoting with the current situation. So uh, well done. And uh, I really look forward to next season. I know our musicians are thrilled too that we are having a next season and not canceling. So um, really, this is, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, now, for those of you who have been faithful followers of this series, thank you very much. It's been great to have you with us every week. Uh, this is our last Facebook live stream for the month. And next month, we will transfer over to a little bit of a different format. And this will focus on the music and musicians of our seasons. So we'll be able to uh, highlight those yeah. as we go on. So thank you very much. We'll keep you posted as to when that will happen and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Gemma and Kim. Thank you, Abby. Okay. It was a pleasure. Great to see you, Gemma. Good goodbye, see you everyone. Soon.